Hello and welcome to this week's Countryside, and we're talking quite a bit about nurseries on this week's programme, and not the children's type, John. <laughs> <laughs> no indeed, Simon. Uh, the nurseries with an awful lot of work attached to them, and uh, talking to Rob and Jill Neal at Bolin Elson, the, the amount of handwork they've got there really is a credit to them, and this new venture of growing strawberries from a, a brand new method. Yeah, and is this the perfect ground of the north for them? It does seem to be. I've never, never mm-hmm. thought of Derby like that, Simon, but uh, no, these people are proving it, proving me wrong and proving that very, very different. Yes, and uh, a sort of different nursery uh, I was at uh, as well was the opening of a Gary nursery. Um, and uh, I speak to, to Gary Coleman and his partner Martina about uh, the struggle they had to, to get that going five years it was in the making, but it's got that little bit different sort of scenario in a sort of curric setting. Yeah, and I think this is the good thing about the people who are engaged in horticulture and nursery. Each are addressing a new aspect of horticulture, and they're all going to fit together in a in a very exciting way, I think, and, a, and it's good to see it developing. Yeah, and you've been at the WI, not oh, a member I, now, eh? <laughs> oh, I joined the... I, I'm an honorary member of the WI, oh, right. so I myself and Noel Kringle are honorary members of the WI. And uh, yes, I did. When, uh, I went up to St John's to join them at a place that I know so well, which is just upriver from where the DEFA headquarters are at Mullinac Cloy. Because there, just alongside the river, where they were actually planting their two new trees and uh, dedicating their new seat, was the very place when we were schoolboys, Simon. We built a swimming pool in the Neb, and we had a whale of a time there, and uh, memories came flooding back in all sorts of manner mm-hmm. on that wet morning. Mm-hmm. Memories of sore feet will be upon <laughs> me when I talk to Sue Dennis, the organiser of the Isle of Man Walking Festival, uh, which is uh, very closely upon us. I chatted to her about some of the walks and mm. about uh, how preparations and, and how interest uh, in the event is, you know, whether it's still holding up. And, and it's a good way to sell the Isle of Man, Simon, because when you walk, you know, you, you see the island from a completely different aspect than the main roads or even the railway or the electric tram. It's a whole new vista of the Isle of Man from the top of Snaefell or any of the other Manx Mountains. So sit back and enjoy this week's Countryside. <laughs> Well, you'll have heard from the Department of Agriculture in the Isle of Man, they've announced a new food strategy, aiming to produce more food from the island's growers. One such man who has taken up the challenge is Robert Neal at Bolla Nelson Nurseries in Jerby. And Robert is actually developing the nurseries there to answer the challenge of the new food strategy. One of the ideas that's come out of the new food strategy is the growing of strawberries here on the Isle of Man. And Robert has busily engaged himself and his wife Jill in just this project. What we've got here is uh, an area of strawberries which have been produced on raised beds. It's the first time we've done this. We're quite excited about it, we're quite optimistic about what we're doing here. So, But we wouldn't have done it unless we'd had the support of uh, John Hostos and Robinsons which have kind of agreed to buy the, the crop in the first place because uh, you know, it's just a difficult market out there. But John has been really good and uh, he's very supportive of Manx produce, Manx agriculture. So. So here we are, this is what we got. If it's your first time, Robert, where did you get the know-how? Are you self-educated or do you find uh, information elsewhere? Well, it's like most farmers, I suppose, you're kind of watching, <laughs> watching the right ears all over the place, aren't you? You've, yeah, you've got to learn it as you go along. But we, no, we have been researching this for a number of years and we've been away at a few, uh, few locations across looking at uh, different techniques for growing strawberries and uh, we've settled on this one. This is going to be the primary way of production, but we've also got uh, an outdoor patch but um, when you look at these on the raised beds, and we'll show you the, the outdoor ones in a, in a minute or two, you can see huge difference in the sort of in the rate is, of growth. This is not a traditional way of growing strawberries. It's not a traditional way of growing strawberries, but it's uh, it's getting to be a very popular way of growing strawberries for two or three main varieties. You can control the crop a lot easier. You can control the amount of irrigation that goes in a lot easier because they're on ra- raised beds. They're just so much easier to pick and manage, So, which there's no stooping down and crawl along the ground to pick strawberries. So. Jill, if I can yeah. bring you in, yes. then, then it's Robert's idea that he's got this all designed now. Are you involved in the work that goes on with it then? I will be most definitely, yeah, but the watering is very, very easy. It's literally, we just open a valve and it all gets watered. It's, it's far more easier than standing there with a hose pipe. <laughs> So you've done both then, you've you've stood with the hose pipe. We've tried everything and in the end an irrigation system was the only answer, yes. Do you see this now then as being the way that you'll go forward now in, in growing your produce? 
For, as far as strawberries grow, yeah, most definitely, because um, you're saying you've got so much more control over the environment. This is a sort of a semi-open structure we're in, but it, it has raised the temperature about two to three degrees, which has made a massive difference, particularly this year, because it's still quite chilly at nights, and uh, you know, being having a, a warmer night has helped the growth of the strawberries quite a lot. But yeah, this is definitely the way we're going to be going. Jill, this must be one of the best kept secrets in Jerby's. <laughs> I mean, you've got signboards all the way along the road. It wasn't mm. hard to find you. Yes, But yes. When, when you come in here, the extent of your operation here is quite remarkable. It is, isn't it? Yeah, we, we are both extremely proud of our business. Yeah, we, we do work long hours, but it, it's, it's an enjoyable you know, it's, I step out of the door and there I am in paradise. But you said you, you, you're open every day except, what did you say? <laughs> We're open every day except Christmas Day. <laughs> we do take the Christmas holiday. <laughs> is there that much satisfaction then? You're obviously very, very much involved. Oh, there is, there is. It's, um, it's marvellous to see all the plants growing as well from that tiny seed, the germination. Absolutely amazing. Nature's wonderful. Now, in some of the other beds that you've shown me as well, mm. um, the, the floral part, but that, that yes. really is quite amazing. Oh, now. it is. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, my background is I trained as a florist. I then diversified into accounts, so both of those skills have come in really handy in the business. Robert's venture here into strawberries is, is a new venture, but you told me also about the new varieties of flowers and hanging baskets and, and uh, different aspects of decoration. Yes. They're developing as well. They are indeed, yes. There are new varieties coming out every year and the, the blossoms on the flowers are fabulous colours. Absolutely beautiful this year. Yeah, very vibrant. And and that's that's something that's going to go on developing, isn't it? It, it is. Yes, it we're is. We're becoming more decorative minded, aren't we? Oh, we definitely are. I'm happy to say. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, Robert, uh, what else? You got strawberries and you got the flowers here. What else have you got here at Bolin Nelson? Well, we've got the tomatoes. Uh, we've been growing tomatoes probably since 1965-ish, and my dad used to grow them, and then we've continued. So, it's a shame we can't uh, grow more. And that the area that we grow. It's gone up this year, but in the past it has gone down. Um, but it's just down to the market, um, really. I mean, you, you only have to go back to the mid-1980s, and there was still probably 350,000 people a year coming here, tourists. And they all needed to be fed. Uh, it was, you know, we used to sell tomatoes like Dale and Collins, Jennings and Klukas, Robinsons, uh, H. Richmonds and Ramsey, Connie Bears. There was loads and loads of uh, wholesalers. Tell, me the, the question, tell yeah. me the question I'm dying to ask you. <laughs> What is it that flavours a Manx tomato differently to any other tomato? Oh, that's top secret. We couldn't possibly, <laughs> <laughs> couldn't possibly tell you that. <laughs> but, but it uh, is different, isn't it? It is different. It's, uh, far, we grow them in soil to start with. Um, we carefully select the varieties that we grow. We, we, we actually choose varieties. We're always trying different varieties every year. We, we choose varieties which uh, will produce flavour. Um, so they grow in soil. And also they're left on the vine long enough to develop a flavour. A lot of the tomatoes, which are grown commercially, some of the you know the, the bigger greenhouses across, um, they're all grown hydroponically now, and uh, they're picked green, or just when they're starting to turn ripe. So they're not getting long enough to de to develop a flavour. Um, if I can summarise that, then mm -hmm. Robert, what you're saying is you're growing them naturally, yeah, uh, it's all and, natural. and you're getting the natural tomato yeah. flavour. Yeah. Whereas in other cases, they might be grown um, a bit artificially, and they lose it. They, they are grown artificially, really. When you when you think about it, yeah, they, they don't get a chance to develop. When you go a little bit further, there's field as well too. Um, uh, it's more more the American market. Um, a lot of the tomatoes they travel bigger distances. Um, and a lot of the containers which, are, which the tomatoes are packed into um, are filled with uh, ethylene gas, which artificially ripens them. So luckily that doesn't happen in the UK. And it definitely doesn't happen in the Isle of Man. It doesn't happen in Bolin Nelson. No, it certainly <laughs> doesn't happen here. No, no. Jill, so, so if we're looking at, at um, uh, tomatoes traditionally grown, uh, we're looking <clears> at strawberries, which, which is a new venture, the new varieties of flowers that you're, you're developing now, where does the future lie? We'll <laughs> <laughs> have to see where it takes us. Yeah, really. yeah, we'll see yeah. where it takes us. Yeah. yeah. Are, yeah. are you open-minded and prepared to oh, sort of develop new yes. methods and yeah. always yeah. open-minded? Yeah. There's, there's so much to learn in horticulture. I've now been working in horticulture 13 years, but I still view myself as an apprentice. So I've, I've got about seven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've got about seven years yet to qualify. So. 
come and see me again in seven years and by then I should be fully qualified. And Robert, here, finally here at Bolla Nelson, is there room and is there potential for you to develop in the way Jill is speaking? I think so, yeah. It's surprising. You don't really know how much your business evolves or the years, but it's just when you, when you stop and look back. And is, see, it, is it a good location? It's an excellent location, yeah, it's an excellent location. Why but, is that? Because we get sunshine, um, we've got sunshine, we've got the best soil in the Isle of Man, <laughs> <laughs> and we've got the best sunshine, it's the best place to be, and you couldn't beat it. Well there, Robert and Jill Neal at Bolla Nelson actually booking the trend of Manx growers. Uh, we all seem to think we've got to stick with tradition and, and do what we've always done, but they're breaking out, Simon, into a whole new era. Yeah, lovely setup there, isn't it? Oh, it's and, beautiful, uh, Simon. It really is. Yeah, and uh, the the strawberries. It's just they're just so I don't know. Just rem- they remind me of Russian Abbey as well. <laughs> oh, oh, those. Are, yes, it's, it's, there's nothing new under the sun, Simon. Is there? No. Russian Abbey were great for strawberries. Do you remember the van with the big strawberry on the side? No. Oh, you're too young. <laughs> <laughs> well, talking uh, about nurseries, a brand new one was opened last weekend, uh, just between Sulby and Jerby. A Gary is the name of it. Well, I went along to the opening to talk to the people responsible for getting it underway, Gary Coleman and his partner Martina. Yes, it was a long struggle. We were fighting for a number of years to get planning, but finally we got there and we are open. That's the main thing. People call it the social club from mm-hmm. Solvi because it's more a meeting point than anything else. It's marvellous the way you've just transformed it, Gary, from just a... It looks like it's just a load of trees that were here. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit of a, a challenge, we could say, but uh, we got there. There's lots lots of little patches of land like this dotted all over the Isle of Man. And you must be pleased with the amount of people. That shows the interest in, in the garden and the way that you know people are, are looking at it in, in this day and age, so the amount of people that's been here today. Well, gardeners are very, very passionate people about gardens. To come along to somewhere like this, and Martina's passionate about plants. I mean, she talks to them all the time, which I think is a bit strange, <laughs> but there you go. It gives them a chance to come and... They swap knowledge, and, and that's a big thing, really. You don't get that in a garden centre. It, it, it's a commercial place. This is a working garden where we grow vegetables that you can come and pick yourself at the end of the season. How, how long has it been, the struggle? We struggled with planners for approximately five years with court cases and one thing and another, but at the end of the day, it's all behind us now, and we just really are looking forward to a nice bright future hopefully. Martina you are a gardener yourself yes, and I, am. Uh, I suppose that knowledge helps when people come around and ask the awkward question you Absolutely. can have an answer. And I'm more than happy to mm. share my knowledge and gain knowledge from fellow gardeners so it's really it, but it's not just this it, you sometimes see here an elderly lady picking some sweet peas sitting next to a young mother picking some vegetables and swapping recipes for chutneys you know, getting the generations talking and getting kids getting their hands dirty. This is a working garden. This is not just a nursery. This will never be a garden center. It's a market garden and a nursery, and it's for people. And yes, I do know a bit about plants. There is much that I don't know, and I'd like to share my knowledge if people ask me. Yeah, well, what sort of range have you got here of different plants and vegetables, as you say? Oh, we've got everything from lobelias, the normal bedding plants, uh, to kiwi fruit trees, fig fruit trees, dual fruit trees. We've got from aubergines to spinach, pretty much every vegetable that you can imagine in between, to different uh, tomato varieties, uh, runner beans, broad beans, French climbing beans. <laughs> So we've got a lot of vegetables, which is more like a lesser customer service. But then I do grow tree peonies, I grow anemones, I grow achalijas, I grow everything and anything. You, It's a vast... Is it, is, it, is it a good environment uh, where you're situated here? It, it's a perfect environment. Mm. We're south-facing and we have with, with, with so much trees around us and the density of it, we're pretty well protected. So we have this microclimate which varies even from the front where we're stood now to where the polytunnel is round the back. Uh, that could be three to four degrees warmer as we speak. It, it, it's just madness, really. Yeah. But it's, it's walk a, a perfect, few yards and yeah, yeah, it's a perfect yeah. environment for us. And yeah, and uh, really, really, really pleased. It's good for vegetables because the the ground is quite damp. Yeah. So you don't have to water a lot. The first couple of years we actually only used our groundwater, which is very beneficial for the plants because it's peaty. So the, the groundwater acted as a fertilizer. 
So it's, it's just perfect here for growing plants and I'm so glad we finally can do it. And what, uh, what, when are you open? We are open uh, Saturday, Sunday and Monday from 9 o'clock until 5 o'clock and we are open at bank holidays. And the other days I'm working as a gardener. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alf Cannon, you've had the, the pleasure of opening the, the nursery today. Yeah, no, absolutely delighted to see another, another small business uh, up and running. And uh, Gary and Martina have put in a lot of work to get this uh, to the stage that it's at. And uh, yeah, I, I really wish them the very best of luck and good fortune going forward. This uh, area here, it's sort of a sort of curricky feel to it, hasn't it? And you know, to find this little space that they've made in the middle of it all, it's took a lot of hard work. Well, it's taken a lot of hard work. I mean, there's been a lot of uh, planning issues around that and, uh, you know, quite a lot of uh, ups, trials and tribulations, shall we say, in, in getting here. But uh, both Gary and Martina have stayed the course. You know, the end result is that they've got their, their business up and running uh, and it's a positive business I think for, for the local area and uh, I hope will be a, uh, a success and um, clearly obviously there's plenty of scope here to to develop it further and uh, you know as time goes on so uh, so fingers crossed for them that, that, that these opportunities will present themselves. It's slightly different I mean it's a it, it's positioned obviously it's quite a way away from everything as you say in the in sort of in Karaki type land and uh, you know I think it's got the uh, ingredients here certainly for success I'm hoping that uh, it'll attract plenty of passing traffic and uh, you know if it grows and develops there'll obviously be the opportunity to uh, I hope bring some staff on board and uh, you know there's more land for here for further development so uh, yes best of luck and I'm really pleased obviously uh, you know that the small business has got off the ground and um, will bring some uh, added uh, diversity in that respect to the area. Alf Cannon there doing the opening ceremony of a Gary Nursery there. Before that, the proprietors of the wonderful venture there, Gary Coleman and his partner Martina. And uh, it's a lot of big battle, like they said there, John. Five years, but uh, finally got there. And what a lovely set, and it's got that sort of Curix feel around it mm. as well. Yeah, and, you know, really good for, for that sort of um, project, Simon. And really... I think we're seeing a new trend in, in, in or a revival of the trend, really, because once upon a time there were a lot of growers on the island, a lot of market gardeners, and this is being revived again now by the people we're meeting. Manx Radio's Countryside is brought to you by NFU Mutual. Well, on a very, very wet morning, I went to Gary Nacloy, another Gary, in fact, which is where the DEFA headquarters are in the island now. We went just upriver of that to where the WI have created their own arboretum. It's developing very, very nicely, and they keep adding to it. The reason I was there was to dedicate a bench they've added there now and two maple trees in memory of some of their members. You'll hear the rain hammering on the top of the gazebo where we were all sheltering. But I was talking to Anne Cotier, who was chairman of the Arts, Heritage and Leisure Committee of the WI. We're here today to commemorate the centenary of the WI movement. We're here in the Jubilee Wood, which was set up in the year 2000. And it's been dedicated to the WI here on the Isle of Man. And today we have dedicated a seat for our centenary and planted two maple trees, which is synonymous with us. Our movement being formed in Canada, one is on behalf of the Federation and one on behalf of the choir. It's a lovely part of the island, Anne. It is, it's beautiful. Some of the daffodils are still out, thank goodness. It is raining today, but that hasn't put a damper on our things. And um, We've got over 100 people coming today to help us to celebrate the WI centenary. And how do you think this will be used then in the future? Will, will, will your members and members of the public be welcome to use it? Yes, we, we enjoy coming down to visit the woods. Uh, we've got six centenary gardens set up, including this one now, and we're hoping that WI members, families and friends will come at the summertime and in, in the autumn and winter and spring to come and have a quiet reflection and, and, and look at our beautiful island just to help people find it because it's in quite a secluded place isn't it um, tell us how you can get to it you can get on the Foxdale Road and it's next door to the Rifle Range in St John's or you can go to the new DEFA building and go to the visitors car park and walk down through the wood and you'll find us there. You've established it here Anne but how will it be maintained in the future? Well the Forestry Board have been very keen to look after it for us and we uh, at various intervals will come down and, and replant the bulbs and in September, which, on the 16th of September which is our WI day we're going to plant another 500 spring bulbs on the bank here and we're 
looking to be involved in community partnership with DEFRA for this site. And have you got any plans for developing this any further and uh, for public use and public benefit? Well, we've set up rose gardens in Ramsey, Castletown, Port St Mary and in Douglas in with the commissioners and Douglas Corporation. Uh, as part of our centenary anniversary this year. And this is this is a, a part of the cultural aspect of the WI? It is, yes. Being in a community partnership and being involved in the environment. Is that important in your movement? It is, yes. It is. As one of our um, aims and objectives is to be it's education for women, friendship and fun, and also being involved in the community. Well, there, Anne Cotier of the WI. A lovely development and one of the best kept secrets of the island are the gardens behind the DEFA headquarters. There's actually a bandstand there, Simon, if ever you want a gig, um, it would be a place to go. I'll go practice me singing then. <laughs> next time. But it's a lovely spot around there, isn't it, it if, is. if the midges aren't out. Yeah, and it, it was interesting for me um, because just by the river where we were was where we used to have a swimming pool when we were school kids. We blocked the neb off and we but dived and bathed and jumped about in the neb all the summer and uh, as far as I know there's nothing wrong with us <laughs> <laughs> that's your opinion right lastly on this week's countryside the 11th annual Isle of Man walking festival takes place on the 11th to the 15th of May to find out how preparations were going ahead of it I spoke to the organiser Sue Dennis yes everything's in place just two weeks to go the first walk starts on Monday the 11th of May it's attracted in the past uh, people from all over the world not just UK Ireland and Wales isn't it yes last year we had some visitors from Canada and Germany this year again we have lots of visitors from the UK and there are fortunately a few spaces left for locals to join in as well. Yeah because people I suppose get this um, thing that is advertised in the way that you know it's only to attract people from from off island but many many, many locals take part in it because many enjoy lo- local walking anyway. It's a good way for locals to get to know a different part of the island for example if you're from the south then you tend to walk around Port Erin Port St Mary area and this will give you an opportunity to explore new places perhaps parts of Mackord for example that you've never been to before. How many walks actually are there because you've got a whole week to fill how many days is it? It's five Uh, days and each day we have about eight walks. Eight walks a day? Eight walks a day. Each walk is led by two volunteer guides who are absolutely wonderful. Their love of the island really makes the walk much more interesting for everybody. The walks vary tremendously in length and in ability. Ha- and in ability. Yeah, yeah. What sort of age range have you had in the past? Generally, we tend to get the actively retired people, but we do have a lot of, sort of people in their 30s and 40s that are starting to join in with the walks, which is absolutely fantastic. And we cater for both singles and couples. And in fact, a few years ago, a couple met on the walking festival and last year they got married, which is really sweet. Wow. <laughs> but it's not just about the, the walking as well. It, it, it is an event where people can make friends, isn't it? Because you've got entertainment and everything laid on as well. Yes. And that's one of the things that makes the Isle of Man walking festival unique. Most other festivals, you go for the walk and nothing else. Whereas here on the Sunday, we have a welcome evening, which gives everyone an opportunity to meet guides and fellow walkers and have a wonderful hot pot supper. On Monday, there is a tour of the wedding cake, which David Cretney this year is organising. So I know that will be very entertaining as well as informative. Wednesday, we have the Shenanigans Band, which is always a good fun evening and on Friday we had the Kipper Cayley to round it all off. But going back to the local side of it we mentioned about the locals you say about you know people down the south probably stick to the south. Is it I suppose a perfect opportunity to go with some other people and to find out a little bit more about that area from the guides? Yes and because the walks are all linked to public transport it means that you don't have to sort of think to yourself right if I drive to Macord I can do a five mile ten mile walk and then I have to think about how to get back to the car because our walks are so closely linked to public transport you don't need to worry about that at all so you can go to Douglas get the specific bus or train or tram up to the north of the island do the walk and the guides will make sure that you get the right bus back down to Douglas. Can people just do one day of it or one walk of it whatever can they choose anything? You can do absolutely anything Um, if you just want to have take a day off work and do one walk that would be absolutely fantastic we just ask that you do book in advance we'd like to have an idea of numbers about a week before 
the festival so that we can arrange the transport if we need to make sure that there's perhaps a double-decker bus and so that the guides have a good idea as to how many people will be joining in. I mean, what do they need to bring with them? Do they need to bring um, drinks and, and bananas or food? <laughs> <laughs> Although some of the walks are not that long, as in about five miles or so, the guides will make sure that it's an enjoyable experience so the walk will be done at a leisurely pace so the walks will start at about half past nine ten o'clock because you're out for the day you do need to make sure that you have some lunch and plenty of water and do make sure that you have suitable shoes for example walking boots wellington boots are not a very good idea for walking in and our weather can be a little bit pernickety shall we say so you do need to make sure that you have layers and a waterproof coat all in all looking forward to it by the sounds of things and if people want to get involved with it help out or join in on the walks where can they get the information from you can pick up a walking festival brochure from the welcome center or you can go online to visit isleofman.com slash walking and download a brochure once you've decided which walk that you would like to do the best person to phone to book the walk is sally at isle of man events and their phone number is double six double four six zero. But her phone number is in the Walking Festival brochure. Sue Dennis, the organiser of the Isle of Man Walking Festival. And what a wonderful array of walks they've got. And to, to attract a lot of people to the Isle of Man, whether they go anywhere else, uh, whether they've got any energy after some of the walks, because they're quite long, John. They, they are too, Simon. But I, I really would like to see the, the walking aspect of the island develop an awful lot more on the island. You're right. There are some tremendous walks and the variety of walks from the glens, the coast. We've said this before the glens the coasts the hills it's it's all there and all within this small island you know the variety is enormous and uh, i i think we should develop it an awful lot more yeah and uh, just quickly that one of the things i found we've we got one of the maps that says about you know the walks and things in the island and it's amazing we hadn't thought about walking yeah you know, that's right you know, hmm. <laughs> Manx Radio's Countryside is brought to you by NFU Mutual. Well, that was this week's Countryside, John. Plenty of uh, rural activities that we like to get out ourselves and have a look, isn't it? Yeah, and meeting all those people, Simon. Yeah, very good. We'll be back next week with more from the Countryside.